<laughs> Daredevil's great. I don't know where you're getting at with Daredevil. Daredevil's awesome. Yeah, Daredevil's um, awesome. I can't admit really, that I liked it because he'll never let me live it down. <laughs> never. <laughs> Welcome to episode 74 of Comical Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Corbett, and with me is... Lord Horsicles, man! That's it? That's it today. <laughs> Give it a look. You got on me last week because I was like, oh, this, 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 and this. We tried to give yourself 15 titles, so it's nice to just have you as Lord Horsicles again. <laughs> well, okay, fine. I'm Ultracles? Uh, Holster Ultron? I mean, consider where we're going tonight. <laughs> well, you're, you're trying. I'm trying. Yeah. Captain Horsicles? <laughs> <laughs> we also have a very special guest today, Mr. Jacob Simon, the Hello. writer of Goners. How are you? Doing great, man. How are you? Good. Just trying to beat the heat. Where do you live? Uh, California. Oh, yeah, yeah. Definitely yeah. hot over there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, well, the thing is that really sucks is my, I have like an entire side of my apartment has just windows that face uh, west. So when the setting sun hits, it just forever long sunlight just hits my apartment and just bakes it. So it's real fun. It's Sounds like it. <laughs> Can you get you yeah. some of those shades that uh, my wife had once? Uh, I don't know. They're like, I can't think of the name of them, but they're like brown. Like the they, bamboo shades? No, no, they actually like they're not bamboo. It's like a uh, material, but it reflects. It takes the sunlight and blocks it out and like pops it back out. So it like it hits the window and goes back out. So it doesn't go to your apartment, and it keeps you cool. I, I can't think of the name of it to save my life. My wife knows. Yeah, actually, I did this. I did this thing where I kind of like made my apartment look like a meth lab. I uh, <laughs> I I got some uh, foam core and I just, I just uh, taped. Uh, uh, aluminum foil. Yes, he went all Mexican <laughs> on it. All right, I was going to totally say, it's did. aluminum foil, that stuff, man. I totally did. I just aluminum foiled it. And then, uh, I, yeah, I put that up. And then everyone that, I was like, I remember I, when I when I was dating, uh, people would come to my house and just like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> everyone was really afraid. They would text their friends like, hey, I'm going to this apartment. So just in case you don't hear from me. <laughs> Here in Texas, that's normal. Yeah. <laughs> you drive around the corner, hey, aluminum foil. I know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, guys. Fucking desperate times, you know? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so did I you always... ask him how to pronounce his name, or did you just get it right? No, I got it right. That's not how you said it a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> That's well, why I'm throwing you to the bus. <laughs> I, I put the H in the wrong place when I put it a couple of weeks ago. I think yeah, I got... no, uh, it's a very complicated and fun to get wrong last name. <laughs> yeah, we had a, a plethora of fun names that day. Yeah, it was it was you, and it was uh, Cody Sheety. <laughs> And uh, I was just pronouncing everybody's name wrong. It was bad. <laughs> and, of course, I was at egging him on and continuing on with it and just took it a whole bad place. <laughs> nice. You got some yeah. more on my shitty. <laughs> <laughs> shitty semen. Yes, exactly. That was the other one. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Well, let's – Yeah, uh, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been an interesting, uh, uh, interesting life for sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I can imagine. <laughs> School, it's really fun. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's move on and let's talk some comics because that's what we're here for. All right, sure. So, what were your uh, top two books this week, Miguel? Hey, all right, number two, Hellbreak number two. Oh yeah, uh, Colin Bunn and Brian Chirilla. Yeah, I know you tell me I got the Colin Bunn glasses going here, but man, I love Hellbreak. You got demons. That's right, everybody, take a drink. You got priests. <laughs> you got more demons. Another drink. <laughs> You do love your demons. It just it's just it's like watching a horror film, man, but you know the demons are a little bit on the funny side and and of course people go to hell, do these hell missions which is like really messed up. But I love the book. And of course only tweeted me back and told me, "Well, hell, you're going to love where it's going then." So I'm I'm pretty stoked and that's why it was my number 2. It's a really good series. Uh, if you don't know what it's about, it's about this team that deals with exorcisms that are too bad for the normal priesthood to deal with. They enter into hell and retrieve the soul that's been expunged by the demons and then bring it back into the real world and put it back in the body where it belongs. So they have all this technology meets religion kind of stuff going on in the book, and it's, it's pretty cool. you got to be pretty badass to just, like, suit up and go into hell. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then come back. <laughs> <laughs> and every hell is a little bit different. Some of them are exactly what you expect, fire and brimstone, and some of them are a little psychedelic and weird. So it's, it's a fun read. I really liked it, too. It didn't quite make my top three, but I liked it. What was your number two? Uh, my number two is actually spread number seven Ooh. from Justin Jordan and Liam Cobb. Uh, normally Kyle Strom is the artist, but I guess for some reason he took a break on this issue mm -hmm. and Liam Cobb filled in. And it was a really good one shot. Uh, it told the story of this guy who was a scientist who got trapped inside of the contaminated zone at the beginning of the spread. So when all these monsters first started popping up, 
him and one other scientist and this woman uh, were fighting against them. And they, they discovered this child who was the first child that was immune to the spread. Like it couldn't be contaminated and his blood and saliva and stuff like that might actually be capable of dealing with it. So what do you do in those kind of instances? You, you take some blood, right? <laughs> well, no, <laughs> you know, in the main storyline, no has hope the baby and he's trying to figure out how to use hopes, tears and, and saliva to kill the spread. Uh, but in this one, they actually dissected the child <laughs> took him apart and it just crippled the, the one guy who found him. So, at the end of the issue, it's really fun because he, he walks out into the spread and just gives himself to it. That's fun. <laughs> well, it's, it's fun the way that it happens because there's a great play on words where uh, he's saying that God gave this curse to the earth and that he was going to go forth and spread the message, basically, which kind of just was a great play on words, the title of the book and stuff. And, and that guy actually ended up becoming the preacher who you've I, seen in the previous issues. I think he's got it confused who brought the spread. <laughs> But, yeah, it's a great book, man. I really liked it. Yeah. I might shit my pants if that ever happened to me. <laughs> Stuck in a, in a cabin like that and freaking some, I don't know what you would call it, a blob with arms and, or a blob with spikes that just eat you? It's just a parasite. It's weird, man. Yeah. What about you, uh, uh, Jacob? Have you read either one of those? Um, no. I, this week was crazy for me, just the Trey Fairback release. I only read one comic this week. <laughs> And that was Batman 40. Oh! <laughs> well, I, I think uh, both of us have Batman number 40 as our number one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> number one. Uh, the, the ultimate Lethal Weapon 2 uh, homage. Just like everyone's <laughs> laughing. They're just like both like beaten to shit. And, I mean, I, I, there's nothing I could say that wouldn't give anything away, but it was just a brutal book. It was surprising. It was, it's, it's, if ever, anyone actually sits back and thinks about how they want the ultimate kind of like throw down to be between... Batman and Joker, this would be the book to like read. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm I'm really trying so hard not to give anything away, but it was just it's a brutal book. Well, we'll I, we'll, we'll spoil a little bit, but we won't talk about the ending. How about that? Uh, okay. So, in game is this thing that's been going on for a while. Joker's kind of misled everybody about his origin a bunch of different times, and the one that he's been going with mostly is that he's immortal. And so Batman's trying to disprove that, and in this issue, uh, he finally manages to confront him because he's trying to get his spinal fluid to create a way to deal with the Joker serum that's infected so many people. But as it turns out, Joker was lying. Of course. <laughs> so the component that they can't figure out to the Joker serum is somewhere else. And when you find out where it is, it's it's pretty shocking. And there's really, this is just the ultimate end-all, be-all Batman versus Joker story. I think Greg Capullo and Scott Snyder just knocked it out of the park. Uh, it's It's exactly what you want the end game between Batman and Joker to be. And I just loved it. Well, you know, you saw me, I read it <laughs> and I was just taken aback. I didn't know how to feel. Uh, first of all, it was amazing. It's probably one of the greatest things I've read. Uh, I love the way it ended. The way it ended. I was like, that did not just happen. <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> oh my God. I was, I was like, really like, I don't know, man, taken aback. I was gasping for air. Would you say that it's their best arc? On the Batman series so far? By far. By, we, hell, we've been tweeting about this since they started the end game. And hell, I tweeted a bunch of times saying, Greg, what the hell, man? This is like freaking amazing. And of course, you know, he retweeted. But oh, some of the artwork in this issue specifically oh, was incredible. Yeah. The dinosaur. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> I love the dinosaur with the Joker face. Yeah. Lipstick. Oh, man. I, I, I don't have the words. This end game is something to have. It's something I will always treasure that I have. Yeah, if you people haven't read it, you got to pick up the trade when it comes out because it is it is a great run. Well, because you know, my top three have always been Harley, Joker, Batman, Harley, Batman, Joker, but Harley's always been number one. But the Joker and Batman may have just passed through. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I was like, damn. That's all I can say. And if you don't have it, you should have gotten it. If you don't get it, you better buy the trade. Yeah. Hell, I might just buy a trade just to have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm dead serious. I'm 100% serious. It's one of those books that just like took a hold of me and didn't let go. It's kind of like... Well, it's definitely going to enter the, the pantheon of Batman versus Joker books. If somebody says, you know, I want to read a really good Batman Joker story, what should I read? You could hand them this, and it would live up to their expectations, I think. I mean, I loved Hush. I loved The Killing Joke. But this is... Yeah. This is... Yeah. It's, it's an instant classic, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, we, we fawned enough there. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Let me plan to drool off my face. <laughs> well, every week we pick a pick of the week to highlight as well. It's kind of a newer book or something off the beaten path, just to kind of talk about a little bit. And this week, I think we both picked the same book, uh, Pisces Number 1. Yes. From Curtis Weeb and Johnny Christmas. Mm -hmm. And they're the creative team on Rat Queens, which is a book that we both really love as well. Mm -hmm. So Pisces follows this guy who, well, it, it's, it, I guess I should start out by saying the book is really hard to explain and really hard to understand exactly what's going on. Because it starts out with this guy who's living in modern times, and then all of a sudden he's back in the Vietnam War, 
and then a few minutes later he's in space. And he just kind of jumps around. It's the same dude, and he's always putting these really precarious situations. And, I mean, the artwork is stunning. Each individual mini-story is really interesting and really intriguing. It draws you in, but I still have no idea how they're connected. The whole beginning with him in the, the emergency room, the hospital thing in the beginning was, okay, this is interesting, okay. But when you got to the Vietnam part, and that whole thing was going on, like, that's when it got me. It's like, damn, oh my <laughs> gosh, okay. And then after that, he wasn't, what the hell is going on? And I just looked at you like, okay, this is pretty cool, but I don't know what just happened. <laughs> yeah, it's, such a, it's such a bizarre story, and it's hard to figure out exactly where they're going, but it's only been the first issue. So uh, if you like weird stories, which you know I do, I'm a huge fan of weird books, check this one out because I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah, great book. Yeah, I look forward to it. It, it, look, it sounded really good. It is. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, huh. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that. It's, it's good. <laughs> I mean, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Batman still has me reeling right now. All right, all right. <laughs> Forgive me. Well, let's move, on. let's move sorry, on then man. and talk for a minute about Jacob. Okay. So uh, Jacob is the writer of a book called Goners, which also comes out from Image Comics, which we are both tremendous fans of. Oh, you know I liked it. Uh, but our audience might not know what the book's about. So why don't you go ahead and tell them, Jacob? Uh, it's, it's a story about this family called the Latimer family, and they exist in a world where the supernatural and, and the folklore that we all used to believe in actually exists in this world, and everyone knows about it. And they're kind of, I keep saying it's uh, they're akin to like the Swamp Thing is to the green or the Animal Man is to the red. This is like what they are for mankind, this family. Uh, so basically, they're like a, a group of hunters, and, and to, to fund their endeavor, they have a brand that they made out of their name, and so they have toys and, and a reality show and all that kind of stuff. And, and on this reality show, um, a mishap happens, and they actually get killed live on TV in front of everyone, including their children, who are next in line to inherit the mantle. So Zoe and Josiah are their children, and uh, they now are being hunted because there's this power vacuum that's uh, occurred, and they're unprepared and they need to kind of take off on their own and figure out who killed their parents and why. And it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh yeah, it's, it's definitely a, uh, it's, it takes place over one night. So it's pretty quick and fast. Um, I kind of wanted to do a John Carpenter vibe where it's just kind of like a frantic, uh, you, you don't really know what's going on as much as the characters know. So, um, you're kind of just thrown into the whole mess of things. Yeah. And there's definitely a sense of urgency to each character as they're going along you have so many cool supplemental characters in the book, and they fight really interesting villains. It's not all the same kind of horror villains you expect to see, you know, mummies and werewolves and vampires. Mm -hmm. There's, like, all kinds of weird and unique monsters that they're coming up against, which I really liked. Yeah, it was... <laughs> uh, it's, it's weird because I, I was given a book when I was really young, and it's a kind of a... I don't, it doesn't have the cover on it anymore, but it's, uh, it was like an old... I can't... It just had a bunch of folklore and superstition and... and and myths and turn of phrases and all the kind of stuff that happened from an era that we no longer really think of or believe in. And uh, I just thought it was really interesting because it, w it was a unique world that a lot of people lived in, in different cultures and, and in different countries. And um, I just thought, you know, these creatures are really cool and like no one's done anything with them. So why don't we just try to do something with them? How did you choose the family name of Landers? Because I was thinking, of, uh, when I was thinking about, it, I was like, damn, I've heard that name used a lot in other things. I just did it just come to you, or did you take it from something else? No, I, I mean, I did that thing where I think you you type in uh, fancy sounding last names, like, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is a while ago. I did this in college, so um, I was like twenty seven, thirty three now. So, um, yeah, but I I just looked it up, uh, just you know looked up uh, last names, and I kind of found one that I haven't really heard of a lot of. Lot of. And then all of a sudden, uh, Broadchurch came out, and all of a sudden, that, the main family is called the Latimers, and I was like, fantastic. <laughs> so, yeah, but other than that, I haven't really heard the last name. So the fact you brought up a lot of supernatural stuff and everything within the book, and you were talking about it a few minutes ago, I, I don't, well, I'm going to ask you this question first. Yeah. I'm Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Your background is? Oh, I'm half Lebanese, half Irish. Oh, I'm just curious because usually when people write books like this or they start talking about this stuff, they usually have some Hispanic background in there because, you know, all the witch stuff I always joke on the show about and everything else, all these stories I've heard and all these demons and chupacabras and werewolves and, you know, all this Hispanic crap you <laughs> hear back in the day. So I was just curious that – so did you get a lot of stories from your, from your, like, your grandmother, your, your parents back in the day? No, I mean, it's it, – the best part about my childhood in general, like, it informs a lot of my writing – is that I was kind of just like open to a lot of books and film. So it was a lot of my parents kind of just like, hey, here's a book, read it. As long as you read something, you're cool. 
And basically, I read, uh, I saw Stephen King's It when I was like seven years old, live on television. Like, an, it was a two night event. It was one of those event series. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was seven years old or maybe eight. And it came on, and I saw it, and I was terrified. But it made me want to read the book. And the book was like, I think it's like twelve to 1,500 pages. And uh, yeah, I read it when I was like 10 years old. I picked it up when I was 10, and I read it all the way through. And, and pretty much just when Scholastic, uh, the Scholastic thing would come in, my mom would basically just be like, whatever you want, you know, we'll make it work. But we weren't like super well off. But yeah, so she would just like, that was important to her is to have me, you know, reading and just being involved in stuff so yeah my mom was the same way they very much encouraged reading and i you know i grew up reading tons and tons of books i mean i read, read like lord of the rings and mm-hmm. a lot of high fantasy kind of stuff but i also read a little bit of horror i didn't read it i watched the movie and it terrified me so much that i didn't <laughs> want to read it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh yeah there was a couple sleepless nights after seeing that one. Oh no for sure I, m- I remember i didn't really get a good night's sleep for like two months after I- the first night i saw it i didn't sleep at all but i like pretended like i was fine Mm-hmm. And I watched the second night, and uh, yeah, I, I couldn't go to sleep for like two months afterwards. <laughs> so, how did you break into comics? Um, I work in animation. I'm a writer in animation, so I, I write um, Ultimate Spider-Man and Marvel's Avengers Assemble, and a couple of international cartoons that haven't really hit over here. But I've worked with Man of Action. They're the people that created, you know, the characters Big Hero Six, and they created Ben Ten, and yes. yes. All that kind of stuff. And so um, I was one of their regular writers. And just, you know, from working with them for a while, I got to meet a lot of people at conventions. uh, And one of them was Eric Stevenson. So I got to have, you know, at least a relationship enough that he would know my name. Like if I saw him, he'd be like, oh, hey, Jake, how's it going? You know? That's cool. So um, I pitched him a couple things. Some things didn't go through, but uh, I thought that, you know, Goners was a pretty sound concept. And and Jorge has really, you know, unique art, art that I... I don't see a lot of, so um, I kind of was a little bit more like ready to rumble with this one. I, I took it to Emerald City Comic Con. I was like, okay, you know, I got this book, and I showed it to Eric, and you know, he looked through it. We talked, and basically, he just said, "You got to change the cover, and you got to change the title, but the rest of it sounds great, and it needs to come up for Halloween." <laughs> so uh, yeah, we just like hustled our ass and just got it out. You know, it does have a really unique style to it. I like the the layouts of the covers. Because they all fit really well mm-hmm. together, and when you look at it, you know it's a Goner's book. Yeah, then, that was yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I think that's so cool. I love it when creators do that and put the time and effort into the cover. Because a lot of the time, you just kind of get generic, flavorless covers that are like, "Oh, here's a character from the book" or whatever. But when they really stand out and they really are obviously part of the same series, I, I really enjoy that. Yeah, and, that was actually something that um, we really had a hard time with. Like we were struggling with uh, our original cover was um, if you have the trade, if you open up. I think it's like the second page. It's a family portrait with like their faces slashed out. Um, but it actually had a frame, like a gold frame that was really intricate around it as well. And it was just like super busy. And it got to a point where you really couldn't have a logo on it without it getting lost. So we just we kept thinking like simple, simple, simple. And so uh, we did a mock-up of just a panel with those baguks, uh in in the first issue. And I was like, what if this was like the cover? Just these guys. Like that would... That would be a cool cover, I think. And Jorge was like, "Well, let me do let me do my my take on it." And then after we did that first cover, we both agreed that we're going to do every cover with like a monster of the month. And you know, eventually, if the book you know became like a hit or whatever, we could do a maybe a spin off like soft cover where it's just like really good pinups of monsters, and then in the back of that, you have like the horror spotlights that I I do. Mm-hmm. So you know, it'd be it'd be a kind of a cool catch-all book of just unique monsters and what they do that was our plan yeah it was we had a we had a really good time with those covers too i liked them i mean i like supernatural stuff and everything else and i'm a big sci-fi guy and i liked the way i can't even describe i don't know what half of the monsters look i mean what they were um (laughs) the wolves type thing the werewolves the chupacabra i was calling them i forgot what did i call them i called them something i was like holy crap when that book issue came out they were fighting them I was like, okay, he sold me now. I, I mean, I was into it before. I said, okay, I'm all in now. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I said I'm, I'm going to read this. Every, it, just, it was great. It was fun. It was enjoyable. It was like, I think it made my pick of the week a couple of times. It was like, that was freaking awesome. I don't care who you are. <laughs> Sweet. And, yeah, uh, we, really, we, really, uh, we really appreciate all the, the word of mouth you guys have been putting out for us. That was Jorge Corona, right? Am I saying his name right? Was it? Yeah, yeah, it's Corona. He actually, today he was nominated for uh, the Russ Manning uh talent or new coming talent of the year or whatever newcomer talent of the year that's awesome uh, he so 
once the Eisers come around, we'll see, you know. But uh, yeah, so it was re- it was really interesting because uh, it just seems like it's a good. Everything's hitting, you know, in this past in this past week. We we got a trailer out, and then we got the the trade paperback came out, and then now this news for Jorge came out. It's like it's been a pretty good week for us. That's awesome. I'm pretty happy. Yeah, it's got to be rewarding to have all that pay off. Yeah, we're really tired, but <laughs> it's rewarding. Yeah, we hear that a lot. I'm surprised right. you read something because everybody we've talked to, they're, like, they're so busy writing, so busy doing stuff. They don't ever have any time to pick anything, and they pick it up in trade, and then they got to wait for it to get there, and then there's no time to read. <laughs> yeah, I really, I really do. I try, I try so hard to read um, week to week. It's just I have a lot of things hitting at once because I, I also still write for animation, so I'm doing that script, and if I'm not doing that script, I'm doing a Goner's script or whatever, and it's just – I'm constantly always sitting inside my my house in front of my desk and I don't really go out and I don't have a tan anymore. I think I'm scared of the sun. <laughs> uh, yeah, so <laughs> and I have the AC on the entire time cuz I'm just too hot. Nothing too wrong hot. with that. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. It's like 65 yeah. in my house. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Nothing wrong until I get the bill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, speaking yeah. of uh, your animation work in Spider-Man and Avengers Assemble, would you ever want to write a superhero book for Marvel? I mean, yeah. I mean, that's that's something that I feel anyone that says no would be lying. Um, <laughs> it's just it's gotten to that point where right now and this is I actually got asked this question once. So it's a little bit easier for me to answer it this time around. But um, right now I kind of get to play with those characters on the side and I get to make my living off of them uh, through animation but through comics right now, I, I have such a, a really cool opportunity to work my own sandbox. And um, that's kind of like where my head's at right now. But I really, of course, I would love to write like a Black Widow comic or <laughs> whatever. I, I, you know, I have a lot of fun with those characters in animation. I feel you could tell a little bit more adult, you know, story, you know, through Marvel comics. Yeah. So that would, that would definitely be cool for sure. So who is your favorite superhero? favorite superhero probably yeah probably either um the old school sandman wesley dodd sandman um if you count him as a superhero or uh batman <laughs> solid answers <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah sandman mystery theater was fantastic and I, I mean i worked with steve siegel um in man of action so uh yeah i was kind of geeking out when i was like oh my god you got to write that with matt wagner and then i i actually had dinner with two, the both of them one time after uh, the first image expo and I just like sat there and like listened to everything. I was probably like, I probably looked like such an idiot at the table. I was just like, uh huh, yeah, cool, mm hmm, yeah. <laughs> that's, the coolest, say, that's the coolest thing, though. Is, I mean, we meet all these great creators, and it, I just love hearing all these stories from you guys and you know who you've gotten to meet and what you've gotten to work on, and it's just fascinating to us. Yeah, I got a lot of flack for, uh, for Ritus and Arter Love <laughs> because I'm really impressed by what you guys do. And so, like Justin said, when we get to meet people, when we got to meet Greg Pulo, I was just in awe. I really couldn't say I couldn't be my funny self. Craig Capullo was cracking us well, up. Well, he he diffused the situation by <laughs> by saying oh, he had diarrhea <laughs> and that uh, he needed to swallow some gum so he could plug himself up. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the squirts walking around the around the con. I'm like, oh my gosh. Plus, I told him it was kind of intimidating. I thought you were going to kick our ass when we first walked up to you. <laughs> oh, he's a yeah, he's a buff dude. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, he was he's a re- really nice dude though. Yeah, he's really nice. He was really funny. Yeah. So we've you know. We've had a chance to meet a lot of people, and it's, it's been great. And we love to hear the stories. We love the, the interaction. I love the fact that, and I'll say this, you guys aren't dicks. <laughs> you know, because, you know, yeah. people, <laughs> some people out there are just dicks. And yeah. everyone we've had the pleasure of meeting has, has not been that. It's been, like, great. I mean, they interact with us on Facebook, on Twitter, and, and everything else. So it's like meeting your heroes. You know, it's like, it, that's what it's like for me. Sweet. And so it's you really should, cool. You should make me a list so that I only talk to those people because – I am so afraid of meeting people that I admire because I, you know, you just have those experiences where you get to work or not work with someone, but you get to be in the field that, you know, they are now in and you looked up to them as a kid and you meet them and you're, you're kind of like, oh, ah, you're that guy. All right. And yeah. then you kind of everything's tainted after that. I, I So I get really I get really kind of sketched about meeting uh, people that I really uh Admire, <laughs> man! Off the top of our head, I'd tell you real quick: uh, Steve Orlando is probably the funniest guy we've oh, ever he's met. Great, uh, Frank guy. Barbaria, another guy, is freaking hilarious. Joshua Williamson is a is a card. Alex Link, uh, <laughs> I just keep on going. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've named everybody that I actually currently know and talk to. Which Omar, is great. <laughs> Omar Spahi, uh, he's, he's he's a card. Seek Donnelly. If you if you ever get a chance to meet Seek Donnelly over at Awesome, he's a guy that'll change your life. He's a very very cool guy. Sweet. Yeah, that sounds good. I haven't met him. He's 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 a true champion. Uh, he suffers from an illness, 
and he's a true he's a true hero in my mind for what he's doing. And he's uh, he's a good guy. Very cool. Oh damn, Kel Simons too. I can't leave him out. <laughs> he might kick my yeah, ass. Yeah, <laughs> we uh, I, I hit him up on Twitter because um, oh man, I can't believe I can't remember the name of this. It's his new book, Rain. Uh, Rain. Yeah, yeah, Rain. There you go. Uh, one of his characters in Rain is named Seth, and that's a character. That's a bad guy in in Goners. And I was like, how did you come up with that name? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's like the most random name that we both came up with and it's just so weird how like things like are in you know in the atmosphere somewhere and people just kind of grab on to both of them at the same time you know yeah it happens yeah it's it's really weird just because Seth was like oh that's unique and I don't I don't know anyone that's using that name <laughs> <laughs> same thing with Latimer like I said before it's just it's so weird what happens yeah we met so many cool people Zan- Xander Cannon yeah we've, we've had a lot of good luck I mean we've met a couple that were just kind of sketchy at mm-hmm. conventions and stuff, yeah. but yeah. I mean, it's been like ninety five percent awesome people. So. I didn't get to meet. I didn't get to talk to Fialkov because I wasn't here when that went down. But I listened to the show. He's pretty pretty cool guy. Yeah, um, he's great. Um, yeah, you know, it's just it's one of those things where it's not even just comics. It's like it's entertainment in general. You just there's some people that are just they they do their job and they do it really well. But you know, then you have the personal uh, personality side of them that you get to like kind of see behind the curtain a little bit and you're just like oh man <laughs> oh man we got to the point where we actually have a we actually have a, a writer <laughs> or whatever he does now kind of pick on us when we oh, go to cons he, he literally messes with us i'm like come on man you, you know joe rubenstein no i don't I mean not not personally no he did the uh, the original four issue wolverine miniseries back in the mm-hmm. 80s mm-hmm. Uh, so we met him at a con here in houston and you know he talked to us we interviewed him he was really kind of Kind of put off by us a little bit at first, but then he kind of came around to us. And then every uh-huh. time we've seen him at since, he'll follow us around the convention and like make fun of us. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And that's cool. It's got to feel pretty good, though. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's like, that's great. <laughs> I just want to be followed around by someone just making fun of me the entire time. <laughs> you need to do some cons. You need to come out some cons, then we can bring all our issues and have you sign them. I'm I'm like a baby writer, man. I just started this thing. It's so it's so overwhelming too. I never realized. I used to work at a comic shop when I was younger, and uh, I never realized how much goes into making an independent comic. Don't get me wrong. I knew there was work involved. <laughs> I just didn't. I guess I didn't realize how much of it was involved. And then to have a job on top of that, man, my fucking heart goes out to anyone that does this. You know, it's like. And then it it also makes me laugh because we were, I was having a conversation with a couple of other uh, creators from Image and we were all just kind of commiserating over the fact that like it takes how much effort it takes to put something out and all the, like the hard work and stress and everything you know getting people to like look at your stuff and cover it and then you get like some blog that you've never heard of of just like fucking rip you apart and you're just like oh man really <laughs> we, we worked so hard for months on this oh don't worry about it. Yeah, it could be digested in like 10 minutes, too, which is great. Don't worry about that. We got you back. Yeah. We t- we will, we'll attack all those people. <laughs> <laughs> One day we'll oh, be yeah, there. No, it's, it's totally fine. It's it's more of just like the, the culture of anything that you put out there in the world to be judged. It's just really funny how much work goes into it just to, uh, to all of a sudden kind of like go back. And, and you could read a million reviews that are great, and then you read one that's just like fucking crawls into your skin and you can't let it go, no matter how many good reviews you get. It's really funny. Um yeah, so it's just the nature of the beast, though, and it's fine. I, it, it was something I definitely got over after the first issue. With uh, with cartoons, your name is never called out. It's just kind of like, oh, man, this episode was like this, this, and this, didn't work. And no one ever says who directed it and who, who wrote it, who voice acted it, nothing. It's just what didn't work. And then when you read your name in print of like how something didn't work, you're just kind of like, oh, that's, it just hurts a little bit. <laughs> it just hurts a little <laughs> bit more. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's been it's been pretty rocking though. I mean, I've been I feel like we've been really fortunate with just the word of mouth buzz that we've been kind of accumulating. And now that the trades hit, uh, we got some really good numbers back from that. So that's it's been really really cool. Well, all I can say about Goners is what's not to like. <laughs> good point. I don't know. I mean, uh, I I we've been having a really good time with it. So hopefully that it comes through. That's all we really care about. It does. Just keep doing what you're doing. We'll keep buying it. We love it. For sure. Thanks, man. And bring and whenever you want to talk about anything else, come back and 
you know, we'll pimp you out there and we'll pick it up too. Because we pretty much pick up anything that comes out. <laughs> we read a lot of comics. <laughs> we read a lot of comics. But we average, what, 30 something to 40 books? It's like, it's like 25 to 35 oh, books. Oh, man. Yeah. I miss those days. I, I used to, when I used to work at a comic shop, I would just, I would have like 40 to 50 books a week. I pretty much read everything that came out. And yeah, now it's like my time. I, I could basically kind of get maybe one or two books a weekend. Yeah, that's it, pretty much it. Yeah, he spent $125 this week. Ah, light week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you could you could write it off though because you have a podcast, right? That's right. So there you go. That's right. Damn it! <laughs> I mean, you're eight dollars a week. Oh come week. on now! You always, you always rip on me that way. Come on now. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> so I'm going to say this: American Idol. And so you think oh. you can dance? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those are uh, those are my. We did uh, our research. My intro before <laughs> writing. I was a uh, I produced on those shows. Uh, when I say produced, uh, I mean on Idol, I produced the content for the website, and on So You Think of Dance, I associate pro- associate produced um, one season, and that was crazy because I went on all these audition cities, and that was just a crazy ride. I've never done anything like that before at the time, and once I did it, I I honestly didn't know how anyone did this for a living. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was so tiring. It was three months of just going from city to city. And working like 13 hour days, holding a camera the entire time and just talking to people and interviewing them and catching stuff and covering dances and people. It, it was just so weird. It's surreal. It's so surreal. And then it gets it gets uh, cut down into maybe like a 30 minute tease and like a commercial <laughs> break or something. <laughs> it's so weird. Like the stuff you do just gets so compressed and uh, it's so much work goes into it. And it's maybe like 30 seconds of airtime. Well, I know we can't dance, and I sure as hell we're suspect when it comes to singing. <laughs> if you listen to us singing as Merman and Beastman, you'll obviously know that we can't hold a tune. No. <laughs> but has anything, I'm used by you saying stuff getting cut, anything in Goners that you did that y'all just took out of the book, you didn't leave? Was there any extra stuff you wanted to add to the book that you thought maybe, hell, if we go back and add these into the book, we could probably sell it out and say, hey, it's some extra footage, kind of like a movie? Oh, uh, um, because <laughs> I mean, uh, it, was that, it was that wild and that crazy, and you had such great imagination. And the, the Sony Mons and something—I can actually see where you could have like. Because there were some parts when I was reading the book, I'm like, okay. And before I even turned the page, he's going to go here, 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 and you went this way. I was like, damn! But he could have gone this way or this way. So I'm just in my head, I'm thinking like, damn, he could have like so much material. I'm like, so I'm just curious uh, if there was any extra stuff. Yeah, no, I actually did that on purpose. <laughs> you bastard! I did I did, I did. I did a lot of things where I was like, these are going to be tropes. And I, I want. I, it was really weird because I felt like if if everyone was in on this chase, this big, this big like onslaught of of monsters like hitting, you know, just this family all at once. I felt like these there would be certain tropes that you would see over and over again of like how they would get to a certain point and, and, and to a happy ending at the end. And so I just diverted expectations every single time I could. Um, and one of the big ones for a lot of people who literally wrote the book off after the first issue was. They were like, oh, that locket obviously is going to be a big deal. Like, it's going to save the day. And I was like, <laughs> okay, no, that's not going to at all. Um, it was just to, t- to tie people to family. That's all it really was. But for the most part, th- to go back to your question, the only thing uh, that I ever cut from the book was Jorge from Venezuela. So their um, perception of just sexuality is completely different from our puritanical American ideals. And uh, so, you know, originally the monster, you, she had areola on on the breast, and nothing was covered. And and I was like, ah, Jorge, it's not. We're we're so late in the game for that to be this book now. <laughs> <laughs> like, you really like that's not. You should take that out. And Surprise! He was, he was just like, he was like, what's wrong with it? I'm like, we, America is just really not. They're not cool ready with, for this. Yeah, they're not cool with boobs. Like, it, it immediately takes it out of being a kids' book. And even though there's like blood and you know violence. It's kind of cartoonish in a way. It's almost like animated in a way. And so that's almost more innocent than seeing like nudity. Like once you go to the nudity area, people automatically go, oh, this is not for kids. Yeah. And I just I just didn't want that to happen because oddly enough, and it's so weird because I hear this from two different people, two different sides of the camp. But oddly enough, people that I've I've done a bunch of signings or podcasts and people that talk to me they basically say yeah i i read this to my kids like i share this with my kids it's like finally a book that i could share with my kids and i kind of looked at them like kind of weird i was like really like it's a little violent but 
in my mind, I kept going back to my childhood, and my childhood was just like this as well. I, I was able to basically set my limit, and if it was something I couldn't handle, I was able to go, I can't handle that, and kind of just, you know, move on. And if it was something that scared me or was too, like, messed up, my mom would, you know, sit down and talk to me about it and just, like, kind of talk to me about the, the reality of the situation and how it's not real and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And and honestly, I feel like I've become kind of more of a uh, kind of just uh, imaginative individual because of that because I think it was a lot of my brain just kind of going to all sorts of places and, you know, early on, and I would kind of grew up with that. And so when I hear that from people talking to me about how they share this with their kids, I kind of – kind of think right on you know that's that's awesome yeah that's really cool. and then and then then I've, I've talked to a couple of other people who don't read comics and aren't kind of part of this culture who are like oh yeah this book is not for kids and i'm like well it's not a kid's book but i mean it's a book that i think kids can read and it's not it's not gonna like freak them the fuck out or anything. yeah <laughs> i think it's gonna be a book that they're like oh, okay cool there's like some red blood you know and whatever i mean if you read you read the hunger games it's the same thing, but without pictures. Yeah. You know, it's like you use your imaginations instead of uh, it being shown to you. So I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of in a weird fence sitting area where I'm kind of like, I get both sides, but at the same time, I know how I grew up and I'm definitely one of those kids that, you know, I was exposed to this at a younger age and I, I feel like I got a lot more out of it. I, later. Think that's a, I think that's a great approach to take. I mean, the more books the kids can read, the better because oh, a lot of kids yeah. these days just don't read at all. So. Anything yeah. to get some reading is a good thing. Yeah. Everyone's got, like, cell phones in their hands now, you know? No one's actually sitting down and just, like, letting their imagination go somewhere. Yeah. It's crazy. You know, listen to you talk about your background. I swear to God you're Hispanic. <laughs> I'm, dubbing you an, I'm dubbing you an honorary Mexican. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, man. I've been, I've been dubbed an honorary Asian as well because I love, like, all things Asian. <laughs> like, <laughs> So, like, uh, yeah, I used to work on uh, uh, production um, coordinating on some direct TV, like Asian market direct TV commercials uh, to basically show that, oh, we're getting uh, these foreign uh, channels for direct TV. And we did like a bunch of them. And I remember just it was a it was an Asian advertising agency, and I was like pretty much the only white dude in there, <laughs> and, uh, and I was like able to hang with all of them like just fine. And they were like, "Yeah, you're totally like Asian." And I was like, "Sweet!" And so they just, like inducted me. It was pretty pretty funny. Oh, I thought he was about to tell me he came up with the "Eat Like Snake" commercial. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> that would be amazing. That's one of my favorite yeah. commercials. <laughs> well, let's move on to our next segment, which I know is Miguel's absolute favorite. Tell me a funny story. So Miguel's going to go first, and then we'll have Jacob tell one. You know, man, I got a number of tragic stories. Now. I told you, we already <laughs> crossed that line. All right, all right, here we go. I'm going to talk about uh, bicycle accidents. Bicycle <laughs> accidents? Bicycle. What's a bike bicycle? <laughs> <laughs> bicycle accidents, okay. Clumsiness seems to happen to go in our family. Well, uh, one day my daughter was riding her bike. She was about 10, 10 years old, I think, maybe 11, somewhere in that range. She was riding her bike down the street and wasn't paying attention and turned her wheel to the left and ran into a car, parked the car, hit it on, hit it pretty good, flew off her bike, and she skidded a little bit on the road on her side. And she got up and she came to me. She wasn't crying. She came because she was upset because her bike was the wheel was bent or the rim, the rim, the wheel got turned and the handlebars got turned. And so actually I take that back. I think it was the handlebars that turned on her. So that's why she ran into the car. But anyway, so I fixed it for her. She was happy again. But and my ex-wife at the time, well, my wife at the time, who's my ex-wife now, said, hey, you need to put some stuff on that scratch so you don't get a scar. And my daughter was like, it's okay. Boys like scars. I was like, and like, like hell they do. <laughs> <laughs> so she has a little scar that she has now. And she's like, that's her war wound. Well, a week later. <laughs> we were riding our bikes again. And we went to a park where you can ride the bikes on the little paths and whatnot. And she's like in front of me and she had stopped or something like that. And I was coming. Well, she wouldn't stop. She was moving. She was in front of me. We weren't going too fast. But she goes, Dad, what? I had my watch in my hand. She goes, Dad, what time is it? And so I grabbed my hand and I look at the watch. For some strange reason, I didn't let go of the handle. So I turned the wheel from straight to left. So my, my bike instantly stopped. 
I flew over the top of my handlebars, bumped on the trail a couple of moments. I, I was like Superman on my belly, and I scratched my watch up pretty good. And <laughs> Did you scream, it's time to die? No, no. <laughs> All I can tell you is I flew off the freaking handlebars so quick. I, didn't, I never thought that would ever happen. And so I flew off the bike, and I bounced. And I kind of put a hole in my shirt. Didn't get a scar like my daughter, but I scratched up my watch, and I was pretty much pissed about that. I kind of laughed at myself, but my daughter was, was just cracking up and making comments like, Huh, you thought me falling off my bike? I said, I didn't hit a parked car, though. But you turned your <laughs> wheel, Dad, with the watch. Why did you let go of the handle? <laughs> so, like, come on. So, yeah, so I got picked on about that for a while. So my daughter and myself, I guess we're both clumsy. <laughs> my sister did that, too. She was uh, riding her bike, and I was rollerblading in the street next to her. She looked over her shoulder and just ran straight into a boat. <laughs> Somebody had a boat parked in their driveway. <laughs> uh, that's funny. <laughs> So, yeah, so riding bikes can be dangerous. <laughs> Next time, let go of the, steer, the, the steering handle. I have no idea why I did that. It's one of those, you know, just reflex. And, oh, yeah, it's, ah! <laughs> it's pretty uh, bad, man. It was pretty funny. <laughs> I don't know how funny that was, but it hurt. <laughs> pretty funny. Pa- pain is always funny. Pain is always funny. Yeah, years later, pain is always funny. <laughs> what about you, Jacob? You got a funny one for us? Yeah, it's kind of a long one, but uh, it's, it's actually pretty out there. And I feel like I've only told it a couple times, so. I'm pretty ready. Um, so I worked on a show called Full Throttle Saloon in Sturgis, South Dakota. It's a biker show. It, it, it deals with bars that kind of pop up out of nowhere. For Bicycles? Biker, the biker rally. Oh, no, it's a <laughs> motorcycles and all that kind of stuff. I'm kidding. I know. So, oh, okay. It's a huge, it's a huge biker rally. Um, and uh, we had a reality show on True TV, uh, Full Throttle Saloon. And so we were shooting that, and we had to stay – at this bar. So basically it's like Thunderdome and there's just like these, they, they made up these like cabins on the property. That's like a dust bowl. And, uh, we, that's where we stayed for like a month. And so, um, we worked, I worked every single day on that show. And then one day, the cool thing about this biker rally is they have a lot of musical guests. So like guns and roses came. And then also, uh, the, the other really big one that I was wanted to see was Bob Dylan. Oh, cool. And, uh, well, Guns N' Roses, I didn't get to see because they were three hours late to their show, and uh, I, did, I just had to go to sleep. But um, so I was like, all right, cool. I really want to go to Bob Dylan. Um, how much are tickets? And, and basically, it's just absurd because it's there's like a million people in this one town. And so when we were on the show, uh, I guess the show had a previous season the year before that I wasn't on, but they told me, oh, you have these city badges that you can – you basically get a badge, and it's a city badge, and what happens is – you could show it around the city and get into places to shoot, but that doesn't actually happen for different venues that show concerts. But they said that they hire local people, and that usually if you just show them the badge, they don't know any better, and they'll let you in uh, in through the back gate. Hmm. So I was like, "Oh, sweet!" So I caught a ride on a bus, like a makeshift bus that was like selling beer in it, and uh, we went up to this other venue uh, that was like a pop up um, bar, Thunderdome type thing. And I went to, like, the back gate. And uh, it, these, these places are huge. So going to the back gate means walking for a long time to get around it. So I, I walked the back gate, and there's this, this, is like this guy there. And I was like, hey, I'm here to cover uh, the Bob Dylan show. And he was like, oh, cool. Uh, what, what badge do you have? Or he's like, who are you with? And I was like, oh, I'm with um, Rolling Stone Online. <laughs> and uh, <Yeah>. Go big. <laughs> and so he... he was like, oh, cool. He's like, do you have credentials? And I was like, yeah. And I showed him the badge. And I thought that it was going to be fine. And he was like, oh, I've never seen that before. Hold on one second. He, like, walked away. And I was like, shit. And so what I did was I text myself. So I basically typed my own phone number and I text myself. And I said, you know, um, if if they give you problems, have them call me. And I looked up the editor's name on Rolling Stone Online. And so I typed the editor's name uh, below it or whatever. And so um, I didn't know what to do. So basically he brings a guy back and they, there's this guy who looks like he's like this like high class city slicking manager guy. And he's like, hey, can I help you? And I was like, yeah, I'm with Rolling Stone online. And uh, I was told to come to the back gate. But I mean, this whole Sturgis thing is crazy and I don't even know where to go. So maybe I'm in the wrong spot. And he's like, oh, cool. So, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah. And it was the editor that I wrote down in the text message. And so I showed him the text message. And he's like, oh, yeah, he could be a ball buster. He's like, no problem. And so he, like, lets me in. <laughs> and I'm, like, walking in. And, and backstage, it's backstage. And so backstage, 
believe it or not, Bob Dylan was opening for Kid Rock, which is really <laughs> weird. Yeah. Um, so, but but in backstage, like Kid Rock had all his like you know pole dancers and whatever, and there was like a bar, and people were just like getting crazy, and I'm like, oh my god, this is crazy. So I'm like ready to hang out, and I was like, cool. Um, so I'm just gonna chill here, I guess, and I'll wait for the show. And he's like, no, 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 you can't, you can't wait back here. But I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna have the bouncers walk you to the front so that um, you can kind of get the show from the front. And I'm like, oh, cool. Uh, do I need a badge or anything to kind of go in? Because I don't want to get kicked out if I don't have a uh, like a like a bracelet, like one of those like bracelets. Right. And he's like, no, you don't need it. Uh, we'll have a bouncer just like kind of take you there, and he'll they'll, they'll all know who you are. And if you have any problems, like here's my number. And he gives me his number. And I put it in my phone, and I'm like, all right, cool. And I see Bob Dylan go up, and I'm like, hey, have a good show, Bob. And he, like, kind of waves to me, you know, he's like, hey. <laughs> and uh, so he goes on stage, and I, I get, like, escorted to the front. Everyone, like, looks at me like I'm, like, this weird dude. And I have, I have, like, a notebook, like, one of those pocket notebooks, and I pull it out. And so I'm standing there, and everyone's like, who are you with? And I'm like, I'm with Rolling Stone. And everyone's like, oh, that's so rad. And so, like, everyone's just, like, chilling with me and, like, buying me a beer or whatever. And I'm just like, this is <laughs> awesome. And, uh, and yeah, and everyone's getting like super into it. And then, um, but I'm like freaking out because, oh, by the way, uh, when I was getting that guy's phone number, my hand was, my, my hand was shaking so bad. Cause I was, I've never lied like this in my entire life <laughs> and my hand was shaking and he looks at me like something's wrong. And luckily enough, uh, one of the people I worked with just quit smoking. And so I went. Yeah, I just quit smoking. Like I, I have like a weird twitch, and he's like, "Oh man," he's like, "That's the worst." I just quit like five years ago. Just keep keep up with it, and good luck, man. And I was like, "Sweet." And then the best part though was is that that was Bob Dylan's manager. Oh, yeah. Oh, so man. I, had, I had Bob Dylan's manager's phone number in my phone for like ever. But so Bob Dylan comes on, and he was terrible. So <laughs> that's, oh. that's the end of it. Was it was it was, it was horrible because. It wasn't like Bob Dylan isn't great. Like he 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 was he was great. It's just that I think he's gotten to a point where his voice is kind of kind of gone a little bit. Yeah. So it's kind of like, and he doesn't really move around a lot. So it's kind of just him. And there's a lot of background people and and uh, yeah, it just it kind of bummed me out because I I went through so much to get to it and then I was like oh no and then Kid Rock came on and apparently everyone freaked out about that. So everyone that was there apparently was for Kid Rock. <laughs> it made me so sad. I was like, oh, where am I right now? Uh, yeah, so that was my funny story of just kind of like sneaking my way into a Bob Dylan concert. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> some uh, some good tips in there for aspiring liars. Yeah. <laughs> Go big! I just, I just quit smoking. I'm sorry. I just got yeah. crack rock. <laughs> Dude, you have no idea how freaked out I was. I was like, like my back was like sweaty. Like my my shirt was just sticking to it. I was like so freaked out. <laughs> That's awesome. It's crazy. Now I don't know what to do when I go see a big band. I want to get. <laughs> I'm a Rolling Stone. <laughs> Rolling Stone online. Yeah, I don't think telling yeah. me for comical podcast is gonna get Not, you very far. Work. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, uh, moving on. We we do have a giveaway that we have to announce the winners for. Okay. So we gave away two four day passes to Comic Palooza, which is the big upcoming convention here in Houston, uh, May 22nd through the 25th. And our two winners are at Facing Backwards on Twitter, which is Donald Hayes and Calvin Gravel on Facebook. So, guys, reach out to me, email comicalpodcast at gmail.com, and I'll let you guys know what you need to do to get those tickets. A lot of hoops you got to jump through. Uh, not, really. <laughs> not really. Oh. <laughs> I'll give him a clap real fast. Yeah, congratulations. Let's hear it. For you. Woo! <laughs> Thanks for playing, guys. <laughs> <laughs> two people played, two people won. <laughs> no, no, it was a <laughs> People played, actually. Uh, so moving on to this week's news, what do you want to talk about first, Miguel? Well, let's talk movies since we're going somewhere after this. All right. Yeah, we are going to see Age of Ultron tonight. That's right. So hopefully it <laughs> lives up to the hype. <laughs> All right. So movies, uh, we got the first look at Jared Leto as the Joker this week. That's what you call that? What do you, what do you think that's about what you call it? that? I guess that's what you think about it. I don't know what the hell that was. It's like, who, who's that woman? I mean, uh, yeah, <laughs> I didn't know what it was. I'm like, where are we going with this? You saw the pictures, Jacob? Yeah, I saw I don't know. What the hell? I, I, I laughed at all the memes that came out. You know, Cesar Romero's Joker. <laughs> Cesar, Joker Cesar Romero's Joker. You're like, what the hell is that? <laughs> you know? No, the best ones were Batman with all the bat symbols tattooed on him. Oh, and yeah. Like, uh, you know, they, <laughs> there were so many great memes that came out of it. That's for yeah. sure. I love the Home, Home Alone ones were great, I thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> I don't know, man. What? Uh, Are we tainted? Are we tainted because of uh, Heath Ledger? Uh, I mean... 
people say that. People say that every time there's a new person cast as a hero or villain, everybody's like, oh, it's going to be terrible, whatever. And they're always surprised. I'm not saying that Jared Leto is not going to be able to pull off Joker, but whoever is designing that look for him needs to be shot. Who is it again? <laughs> Who's producing this movie? DC, oh, thank yeah, you. DC. Yeah. yeah. Enough said. <laughs> I'm going back on the rant on him again. What the hell, man? <laughs> I, I don't know. You just go back and look at all the previous Jokers. None of them look like this. There's uh, there's so many iterations that would be okay. And like, if they wanted to give him tattoos, I don't think that's that weird as long as they did it sparingly. But he didn't need the teardrop tattoo. I mean, that was a bit much. So you think? <laughs> <laughs> He's from the I think hood. it's a J. I think it's I think it's literally a J. <laughs> He's from the hood, teardrop. man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Representing, <laughs> I don't. I don't see it. I, hopefully, that's not the final version. That was just a. Uh, it's kind of akin to Colin Farrell going bullseye and just like pointing to his forehead. That <laughs> always fucking drove me insane. And now I'm kind of like feeling the same, kind of the same way. I'm like, eh, I'm really funny. See the tattoos on my arm. Ha 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 ha. ha. Like, I don't get it. Whatever. You know, yeah. we'll, you know we're going to see this. And, I know we'll see it. Yeah. And then you'll find out how pissed I am when it's done, or <laughs> if I'm okay with it. Well, here's the deal: is that. The only way that these things are going to stop is if people stop watching it. <laughs> like the more the more that people make money, the more that they make money, they don't care. Like we've all, I think, learned at this point that they don't care um, necessarily about pleasing fans as long as they make the money. Because I feel like fans are like they're just they're the people that keep coming back. Yeah. Like they keep coming back. Like no matter what. Like I feel like Fantastic Four will still make money. It I mean. Will. I don't know if it's going to be bad or not. Actually, I thought it was going to be so much worse than the trailers led on to be. So, Us too. I mean, just just from all the the previous hate on it and all the previous like leaks or whatever, I actually thought I was like, oh, this is not going to be that great. But no matter what, it's still going to make a lot of money, and um, and that's kind of that's kind of it. It's like one of those things that the only thing that people really understand is the bottom line. And if they keep making money, it's not going to matter whether we hate it or not. Yeah, that's true. And so that that's why that's why remakes keep coming out, and that that's why it kind of drives me insane. Furious Eight, enough said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the bunny. Well, speaking of money machines, tur- uh, Turtles Two. Yes, they cast two characters. Okay, <laughs> who? Tyler Perry. Oh. They cast as Baxter Stockman. Dude, I'm taking my headphones. I'm getting the hell out of here now. You done? <laughs> what the hell? Really? Yeah, I mean, I'm all for adding diversity and stuff, but Tyler Perry can't act. I worked at a pawn shop for about two and a half years, and my boss loved Tyler Perry movies. So we would put them on, and they would play all day long. You felt like was, you lost five years there. Yeah, it, 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 was, <laughs> it was mind-numbing. It was horrible. That guy cannot act. And as, as bad as the first Turtles remake was, I'm, I'm only expecting this one to be even worse. But you know why you're gone. Yeah, I'm going to see Stephen Amell as Casey Jones. That's, right, that's Casey the only, Jones! That's the only reason I'm that's going. That's the only reason. We're going to be like, yeah, it's Casey Jones! Oh, he's done. Let's go. <laughs> didn't, they re- didn't they release a photo of the uh, the Turtle Mobile or whatever it was? Yeah. As well? Did. Yeah. And they announced the Shredder is going to be ca- is going to be uh, Brian T, mm-hmm. who played the bad guy in the Wolverine movie. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. You see the new Shredder suit? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how, many, how many more knives were added? <laughs> It's quite a few. <laughs> I don't know what the hell he, it's like. I don't know. <laughs> it's all about Casey Jones. It's yeah. Once again, it, once again, it's like he points to the knife and goes, "Get it, Shredder." Like, <laughs> yeah. Rocksteady and Bebop have to be a major part of this movie for me to be excited about it. <laughs> I know, right? Anyways, uh, <laughs> they released the first images of Lana Condor as Jubilee in X Men Apocalypse. Did you see those? Yeah. Mm-hmm. She actually wearing the uh, costume you expected to wear, the yellow jacket and the pink shirt and the big hoop earrings. And you know why? Do you know why? Because, well, it's a Fox movie, not a Marvel movie. But still, <laughs> at least Brian Singer's trying. <laughs> <laughs> I think Brian Dennehy must be directing DC's movies. <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're worried about quantity over quality. They're shoving as many characters as they can into their movies, so they don't really care what they look like. <laughs> That's my theory, at least. I got you. <laughs> uh, did you see Kingsman? Well, I don't know if we ever talked about that. No, it's a movie I wanted to go, and that was I was always outvoted on other movies. I saw crappy movies and never got to see it. Did you see Kingsman, Jacob? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I thought I liked it a lot. Yeah. Uh, apparently, Fox is making a sequel, but it's not based on any thing Millar has written. So it might be a, a scenario where the movie comes before the comic. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that could be kind of interesting. I'm gonna see it when it comes out on DVD. Yeah, you you'll like it. The trailers, and everything I thought was great, so I really wanted to see it. I just love Millar's or Miller's life. Like the guy literally can just like throw out a book and be like, "Hey, we're doing a movie in six months." <laughs> it's so crazy. I love it. It's great. Yeah, 
<laughs> I'd, I'd love to see a Goner movie. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully, oh, hopefully you ooh. get to that point. Ooh. Well, well, yeah, hopefully we get to that point. But uh, I just think I, I honestly I started like really like legitimately thinking back on it. I'm like I don't think anyone's had as much success turning his own properties into a movie or their own property into a movie. I mean, Marvel and DC, I mean, they're these huge companies. He's like a man of, on his own and, yeah. and he's doing all these things with with his, his artists. And so it's like, no wonder, you know, all these artists like jump at the chance to work with him. It's like fantastic, you know. So it's he's got a really good thing going on. And, and the cool thing about what he does is he actually thinks in terms of just properties. So the guy's just constantly turning out IP. He's not even, there's nothing that he's doing where he's like trying to make like one long form saga, mm-hmm. you know. So yeah, right. everything's it's, short form. That's yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't go Goners as a movie. Two hours is not enough. Even if you Kevin Costner <laughs> did three hours is not enough. You need, you need to take that to Netflix, man. Well, you could turn the first arc into a movie. Well, you could, but you could go Netflix and stretch that sucker, man. I mean, Supernatural, man. We have all kinds of crap. Is that the, way, new- the way of the future? Thirteen hour movies? Yeah, Dude, no, just, just oh, Netflix you it, man. No, you have no idea, like. Like just thinking about anything goners, it, it would definitely be. I would love to just like expand more on character. Um, this was in, a, in, a, in comic form. It's really good to sh- to kind of have you the reader thrown into the situation like blindly and kind of like test your emotions on just the pure visceral re- level of having to figure out what the hell is going on along with these kids. But you can't do that in like a movie or a television show. So you would actually have to like expand the universe a little bit more and like i just I, i'm really looking forward to doing that in comic book form so i can't imagine what that would be like in <laughs> a netflix 13 hour series that would be rad hopefully one day we get to find out sweet <laughs> there you go <laughs> i hope so that'd be great well the very last piece of movie news is that ben affleck has been spotted on the set of suicide squad batman so not only are there going to be x teen thousand villains batman's going to be in the movie too because <laughs> someone has to <laughs> kick their ass well, it's going to be following the team of villains as if they were the heroes. I mean, you know the Suicide Squad storyline. Yeah. So Batman's going to have a cameo at least. Well, he's going to be there preaching, you know. Yeah. I'm not sure what <laughs> what capacity he will be in there, but he will be in there somehow probably. But he's going to ask him if they bleed. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. And I got a Band-Aid for you. <laughs> so what do you want to do next, uh, comics or TV? I want some TV. All right. Well, there's only one thing for TV, so ah, it's going to be real short. Okay. Uh, Ryan Filippi. Ryan Filippi. Oh, the talk- guy that cheated on Reese Witherspoon. Okay, I'm with you. <laughs> He's in talks with Marvel and Netflix uh, about possibly doing a show with them. So there's a good chance he might end up being our Danny Rand or our Moon Knight or something like that. That guy's a wuss. He can't be Moon Knight. <laughs> he seems as Iron Fist. Dude, he, not even that, dude. He's not. <laughs> you look at that guy and my kid out there could kick his ass. He, no. And I'm not a big Iron Fist guy. You know this. I personally think he's a waste of space. But anyway, my, <laughs> oh, I don't come from, <laughs> whatever. Iron Fist is great. What are you talking I, about? Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> you felt the same way about Daredevil. Then you watch the show and you're like, oh, man, I love Daredevil now. Oh, I never specifically said I love Daredevil. I said it's okay. It's a pretty decent show. Uh-huh. Good fight scenes. Uh-huh. The Kingpin was the man and whatnot. <laughs> he's so weird, Jacob. Like he, 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 <laughs> His favorite characters are like street-level characters. But then when I talk about Daredevil or Iron Fist or Shang-Chi or any of the Marvel street-level characters, he's like, no, they're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Daredevil's great. I don't know where you're getting at with Daredevil. Daredevil's awesome. Yeah, Daredevil's um, awesome. I can't admit that I liked it because he'll never let me live it down. <laughs> <laughs> never. Uh, Iron Fist could be cool. I just, uh, I really wish they would go with someone that did both martial arts and ha- could act instead yeah. of worrying about having a blonde haired white guy. Ray Thank Park. you. Ray Park would be a great Iron Fist. So, yeah. yeah. Lord Maul. All right. <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about. Hell, he could be Moon Knight just ripping people up. Moon Knight has to be a badass. Don't give me some pretty boy out there. Well, that may be a while before we see Moon Knight. So most likely he's in the the first wave of TV series they're talking about. So I guess we'll find out. Is he coming for sure, or are you just speculating? Uh, well, he's been in talks with them, so they're they're trying okay. to re- they're trying to recruit him for some role. Okay. And he's a big name, so I'm assuming it's a big role. Yeah. Yeah, we were thinking down the road they might do Punisher Moon Knight. Well, they've already said they're they're talking about doing Punisher. Oh. <laughs> There's only one Punisher. Yeah, I don't think it'll be Thomas Jane. Damn it. I just don't. Damn it. It'll be great, but I don't think it'll happen. Oh, it wasn't Duff London? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Uh. <laughs> He's he, man. I wish I had like a drum machine right here. Like, but <laughs> I'll add it in there for you. Nice. <laughs> Which is, can you do it in gunshots? Like, <laughs> I could try. You're going to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> going to give you a kick in the balls. 
Cha-ching! <laughs> All right. <laughs> so moving on to comics. Okay. You're, you're going to like this one. All right. Or you probably won't, actually. Uh-huh. Uh, IDW and Hasbro have teamed up and announced that they are releasing an all-female Transformers team. Uh, it's going to debut in July in the Combiner Hunters series. It's going to be a mini-series with six new characters who combine to form a new character called Victorian. You're stonewalling me. <laughs> <laughs> really? Seriously? Yes, seriously. Well, the thing about the thing about oh, Transformers is that like they're stretching for the girls again. They want the girls in the comic books again. That's what it is. Yeah, it, it doesn't bother me so much that there's stuff for you know girls to read or whatever Transformer wise. But I just I don't I don't understand this whole like we got to do one or the other. Can not we just <laughs> just mix it up? Yeah, they could. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I mean, I guess if they're trying to do something unique. I mean, for right now we're talking about it. So there's all kinds of implications if you're combining yeah. men and women Transformers. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. <laughs> so is Prime going to show in there once in a while? Maybe Galvatron, the Dinobots? I, really I don't really have any, very many details yet. I mean, they just announced it this past week. So, Well, the boy out there is a big Transformer guy. He loves his Transformers. Don't get me wrong. So he probably want me to pick that up. And he probably, you know, he'd probably like it. I don't know that I would probably read it. Transformers vs. G.I. Joe? I'm all over it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, if you didn't like that one, you're really going to hate this next one. Oh, come on. So uh, Marvel announced that they're doing another Secret Wars title. They keep announcing new ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this one's going to be called Secret Wars, Secret Love. And it's going to be a bunch of love stories between the characters that have never been explored before. <laughs> <laughs> and you made me sign up for all this crap. <laughs> You made me check all that stupid Secret Wars crap. Well, if you don't want it, you can always put it back. Who's in it? It's a, a various cast of characters. Who cares? <laughs> I don't want about no love. <laughs> and, and if they take it the wrong way, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> I'm going to be did real you pissed. Ever, did you ever read that? Uh, did you ever read Alias? No. Dennis? Oh, man. There's like a really good one where... Oh, Jessica Jones. Uh, she has to investigate the murder of someone and ends up kind of tying into that it was Captain America was having... Uh, like a on the side kind of girl, um, that and that the, the the death was that girl, and so it kind of tied into maybe his Captain America murder. I like I I never saw a story handled in a, in, in a fashion where it was like, oh no, it's an actual like it's actually kind of like a weird romance story, but at the same time they have like you know a murder mystery inside. It was actually really interesting. Hmm. So I mean, if they, I mean, you could do you could do cool stuff, but it, it just. I feel like when people write down vague, you know, uh, log lines, it could sound really boring. I did so, think it was oh, funny. The title was Secret Love. <laughs> Secret Love. How dare they be smirched the Captain America name? <laughs> <laughs> What's next, man? Because I don't like this. <laughs> All right. Uh, Frank Miller is putting out Dark Knight 3, and it's going to be subtitled called The Master Race. It's going to be an eight issue mini. They haven't announced when it's going to start, but. Uh, How's he not getting flack for that? He, I think he is, isn't he? He is. He is getting flat yeah. for it. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, the the first Dark Knight was really good. The second <laughs> one, the second one is terrible. <laughs> it's just god awful. Uh, uh, I I have really mixed feelings about number three, but uh, I'll probably read it anyways, just because. Because it's Batman. This is Batman, and you never know. Frank Miller might make a comeback, right? What kind of comeback is he trying to come back with? Him? <laughs> nice, interesting. Yeah. How do you feel about that one, Jacob? Oh, I, I mean, I honestly, I just remember when the second one came out, I was really looking forward to it. And then I was like, oh, wow. But there, there's some cool moments in it. Like, I remember the Adam, like, coming out of the Petri dish, I think, was interesting. And uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to remember that book in general. But I remember I had an ex who liked that story over the first one. Weird. Like, she liked the second one, the Strikes Again over Returns, which was boggled my mind. Yeah, and, that, uh, is, that is odd. Hmm. Yeah. Like, would fight over it. Like, like, literally get into a fight, like a verbal fight. Wow. <laughs> she was so passionate. It was like her favorite story. So weird. If, if I will say this. I would like to see DC do Endgame as an animated, car, you know, like they do the cartoons, because DC does that well. Yeah, they do, they do good animated movies. That's for sure. I'd love to see that. You know, follow the book. I'd love to see that. That'd be awesome. Yeah, but it'll probably end up the same way that Batman vs. Robin ended up. Where I haven't seen it yet. They loosely touch on the Talon story, but don't really go into much detail. I got you. So, I know mm-hmm. you weren't a fan of it. Yeah. All right, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to throw that. That's out there. okay. I would I would love to write one of those those movies. Like it's just it seems like a rated R movie that you can do anything with, and like no one's gonna give you shit for it. It's interesting. <laughs> I don't. It's so much. weird. It's 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 just made for fans. It's not even made for mainstream you know uh, audiences. So like for that reason, they let you do whatever you want. Well, not whatever you want, but they make it pretty much a rated R movie. 
and it, it boggles my mind. I'm just like, holy crap, like these superheroes are like cussing and killing mm-hmm. and it's just weird. But uh, yeah, I think that would be like a, a, a really interesting project to jump onto one of those. For sure. All right, so the last two things. Uh-huh. Uh, IDW is putting out an Andre the Giant original graphic novel <laughs> that covers his entire life. Uh, it's, it's like his life story in comic book form. Oh, huh. I'll I thought be- that was kind of cool. I know you're a big fan of Andre, so... Uh, big fan of wrestling, period, back in the day. Yeah, it's supposed to come out in September. So. I'm, I'm definitely going to pick that up. Andre the Giant was, was a unique character. Yeah. It was, good, decent, it was a decent wrestler. He was huge. He was, you know, fought Hogan and all those guys and Big John Stud. But, of course, you know he was in The Princess Bride. That's where mm-hmm. I know I'm from. I was never a huge wrestling and, guy. So. Yeah, he, he, that, that's pretty interesting. My, again, my younger boy out there, a big wrestling guy, and so he kind of likes that stuff. So, yeah, I'll probably pick up two of those. That's, I thought that's that pretty neat. Worth mentioning, at least. Yeah. And then the last bit of comic book news is that Free Comic Book Day is this Saturday, May 2nd. Yes, my kids know. They're the ones that told me about it. <laughs> what does that tell you? <laughs> so make sure you go out there and get your free comics. Uh, I know for sure that the DC book they're releasing is Divergence, and it's going to show you who is the new Batman now that uh, Endgame is over. Oh. The, uh, the guy in the robotic Batman bunny suit. <laughs> Chappie. I am Chappie. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I know who it is. It's been spoiled online, but I'm not going to spoil it for our listeners. If you really want to know, you can find it on the internet, I'm sure. Huh. I'll tell you later. Uh, don't do <laughs> <laughs> He already told me. It's, it's Chappy. Instead of saying goodbye, just say the name. <laughs> it's, it's freaking uh, it's Wolverine guy. <laughs> and that's, that's it for the news this week. So uh, I want to remind everybody, you can find us in a few different places now. We're on nerdbong.com. We're on wickedradionetwork.com. We're on Beyond the Dawn Radio. And we are on every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Central Time on YourCityRadio.com. You can also find us on iTunes and Stitcher, and if you find us on one of those, please leave us a five-star review. Follow us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Comical Podcast. If you want to follow us on Twitter, I'm at Comical Podcast. I'm at Comical Podcast, too. If you'd like to follow Jacob, you can find him on Twitter as... Saxon Jacob, so it's S-A-X-O-N-J-A-C-O-B. And uh, make sure to go out there and pick up the first volume of Goners, because you will enjoy it, I promise. Yeah, you should. And here's a cool thing. Maybe... Uh... Jacob will sign a few and you know sell them off of his site or something. You know, <laughs> I wish I, I wish I had a site. Actually, I'm I'm actually doing a free comic book day signing at the Comics Factory in Pasadena in in California. So if you're in California and in Pasadena, I'll be there from three to seven signing on free comic book day, which is Saturday. We do have a lot of California listeners, so maybe some of them will show up. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> if, you get, if you get there and you meet Jacob, you heard about the signing on our show. There you go. I'll give you, I'll give you a high five. <laughs> and, and 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 tell Jacob to send me one in the mail. <laughs> and that's pretty much it guys so uh, Jacob you want to close out the show keep on laughing bitches perfect <laughs> Comic Palooza 2015 is almost here you'll see your favorite celebrities comic book creators and authors hear super cool musical acts experience crazed cosplay events rowdy professional wrestlers raucous roller derby girls literally thousands of hours of programming and so much more remember comic palooza at the george r brown convention center in houston texas memorial day weekend may 22nd to 25th get your passes today head over to www.comicpalooza.com for all the details